And we're on. All right. Um, we're going to continue our conversation about S213 and wetlands with Mary Beth Polly. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so, and um, as you did with Laura, please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. If you could just introduce yourself for the record. Sure. Um, so my name is Mary Beth Foley. I'm a professional wetland scientist certified through the Society of Wetland Scientists. Um, and I'm a regional biologist for Ducks Unlimited covering Vermont and Eastern New York. Um, I've been practicing wetland science in Vermont for the last 14 years since I graduated from Green Mountain College in Pulteney um, with a degree in natural resources management. Um, I interned and worked with the Green Mountain of Finger Lakes National Forest um, with soil scientists doing wetland and soil work. Um, I then worked for the Natural Resources mm -hmm. Conservation Service um, doing wetland mm -hmm. and soil work. Um, and then for a private wetland consult as a private wetland consultant for a local engineering firm, Otter Creek Engineering, where I um, earned a spot on the state's wetland consultant list. I'm the founding president of the Vermont Association for Wetland Science, or VAS, but I'm not speaking on behalf of them today um, because they're a non advocacy group. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of Dex Unlimited, but also um, with the experience I have working in Vermont in the wetland field. Um, so Dex Unlimited is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to conserve, restore, and manage wetlands and associated habitats for North America's waterfowl. These habitats also benefit other wildlife and people. Um, and Ducks Unlimited was started in the um, 1930s when the Dust Bowl was happening. And um, even back then, the wetland loss um, had affected much of the country with the um, spread of agriculture and um, the wet waterfowl populations were decimated mm -hmm. along with other wildlife. So I'm going to go over um, just what but I think wetlands are um, important for, um, this is my, uh, I live in Rutland, and this is right near my house. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is the Otter Creek, um, north of Route 4 Business. Um, those are all agricultural fields. Um, and that's the bridge is over Meads Falls in center Rutland, um, which was settled, the first area settled in Rutland in the late 1700s. Uh, there were mills there. Um, but you can see the devastation. Usually there's a waterfall under the bridge, but there's no waterfall. It just filled that entire area. And um, that's business route four. Um, so this is fresh in my mind this year, but I also lived through tropical storm Irene. I lived in Killington at the time and worked in Rutland. Um, so Route 4 was washed out for a few weeks and I walked across that. So flood resiliency is always um, been in my mind. And in 2011, that's one of the reasons that I went into wetland science, um, one of several reasons. Um, Wildlife habitat is another important value for wetlands. Um, Ducks Unlimited obviously is focused on waterfowl, um, but there are many other benefits. Um, these are black ducks, um, a colleague of mine, um, the Rutland Audubon Society chapter sent those to me that's, they're flying over Otter Creek and um, Black ducks in particular are threatened throughout the east. They depend on coastal habitats to winter and then fly over um, Vermont and breed in the in Canada. Um, so it was very exciting to see that they were here over the winter. Obviously, climate change may be affecting um, 
Uh, but I'm happy that Ladder Creek is providing habitat. Um, river corridor benefits. Um, so many wetlands are along floodplains and river corridors. Um, the picture on the left is Otter Creek. Um, so when that floods, you know, having um, an agricultural field without a riparian buffer, um, there's nothing to slow the water or hold it back when the floodwaters recede. Um, so it just ends right back up in the river. Um, compared to the picture on the right is a section of the Batten Kill, which has thick riparian vegetation and likely um, wetlands along with that. Um, that's the West Rutland Recreation Area to the left, which um, flooded this summer. Um, those are native sedges um, that form big tussocks. So even though it's not um, woody vegetation, still slows flood floodwaters and traps sediment, which improves the water quality. And then uh, just a, an aerial photo of um, where Ladder Creek uh, meets the um, Lake Champlain, and you can see some of those suspended sediments, and then a plume where it goes into Ladder Creek. Um, my background is in um, primarily in water quality, so um, grant funded wetland restoration and um, working with the federal agencies with um, farmers and on forest land. And wetlands are a very important piece of um, improving water quality. Um, so touched a little bit on um, the need for wetland restoration. So of course the protection of existing wetlands is always preferred, um, but it's not always possible. You know, we have a utility line going through an area um, you need to may need to expand a, a highway an exit um, or someone may need to build a driveway through a wetland to access an upland area. Mm -hmm. um, so there will always be impacts. Um, so restoration is needed to offset those impacts, but also to replace the wetlands that were historically lost. Um, along with the future needs related to climate change and the loss of biodiversity. So, how do you restore wetland? Um, think like a, a beaver, that's a beaver dam there on the Brunette National Forest. Uh, they're doing a water quality study there, um, looking at the stream going into the wetland and out of the wetland in different water quality and temperature parameters. There was a beaver out there swimming around when I was there. Um, so that's a good example of um, a non-human wetland restoration project. Um, and then uh, the top right is a, a tree planting project following wetland restoration. So typically a restoration project um, would involve earthwork to restore natural hydrology. So that may be, um, typically we'll see ditches through farm fields as a classic example of draining a wetland, uh, tile drains, so installing um, pipes under the ground is also common uh, historically. So when we look for a restoration site, we're looking for those signs that would indicate that um, the land was previously wetland, was drained. Um, you may see some of the plants and hydrology coming back if it the land isn't farmed anymore actively. Um, so along with that, um, earthwork will establish microtopography, which could be adding woody material, um, doing some earthwork to mimic a natural wetland, especially in a floodplain where, um, or other swamps where um, trees will fall, and the roots will create a big hole, and the branches and logs create mounds over time. So we're basically trying to take a natural pro process that takes hundreds of years and shrink it down to 
five to 10 years. <clears throat> um, most areas will require the removal of invasive plants because the restoration sites are in areas that have been actively farmed. Um, and then native tree and shrub plantings are um, a very important piece as most wetlands um, in Vermont or the shrub and tree component, um, the exception of beaver meadows um, and some floodplain areas are more open and have herbaceous vegetation. And then a, a very important piece is the protection of the land long term. So typically that's with an easement or um, conservation um, with the state of Vermont land program. <clears throat> so I'll talk, I won't read this whole thing, but I'll talk to you a little bit about um, Jacks Unlimited and why we do work on wetlands in Vermont. Um, so as I mentioned, Ducks Unlimited was formed in the 1930s um, in response to um, a lack of waterfowl across the country. Um, and hunters realized even before Ducks Unlimited um, was formed, hunters and conservationists realized that, that um, a continent-wide waterfowl survey was needed so they could document where they, where they were breeding, where they were um, spending the winters and where um, habitat would need to be restored to get the numbers um, back up to a healthy population. Um, so they started the um, first survey using aircraft and um, counting actual ducks and have been doing that since the beginning. Um, we started with uh, creating wetland habitat in Canada, which is the major breeding grounds. Um, and then over the last 40 years, have also focused on the United States um, and the Great Plains along the coast, along the Mississippi River, and um, also in Mexico, where extensive mangrove swamps are important for wintering. Um, and a, a colleague of mine, we're also doing um, uh, coastal restoration, so restoration of salt marshes that are important for black ducks and other other ducks. Um, we're a nonprofit. Um, we have a huge volunteer base across the country, including in Vermont. Um, we have six local chapters in Vermont, um, primarily hunters, but we also have supporters who uh, don't hunt or um, like to um, bird watch and just appreciate the other benefits of wetlands. Um, and we also have a um, nationwide land trust, the Wetlands America Trust, uh, that helps us conserve land and hold easements on land that we've restored. <clears throat> and it's important that we coordinate, you know, we have Sex Unlimited offices throughout the country and we um, coordinate because ducks don't know boundaries, just like wildlife and other birds. Um, and then I'll go ahead and get into the Ducks Unlimited in Loopy program, um, but it's important to help us further our mission because most of the work that we do is grant funded. Um, so it's just another um, stable funding source to help us accomplish our mission. Uh, so the Ducks Unlimited in lieu fee program in Vermont is administered by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, but we have a question, oh, Representative please. Stebbins. So, I'm sure. On the previous slide, you had um, a term acreage influenced. Yeah. What is? Did you say specifically what influenced means? Is that like in lieu? So, um, so acreage conserved means that we um, purchase the land. Um, and conserved it and often will um, donate it to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or state uh, wildlife refuges. Um, we don't hold land long term, but we'll hold easements on the land. Um, 
And Acres Influenced is more like we have a whole agricultural department that works with NRCS and states. Um, so that may include cover crops or um, land that uh, wetland reserve easements that our staff um, reached out to the farmers and arranged um, them to be part of the program. So not land that we conserved, but that we influenced um, the creation of habitat or water quality benefits. Mm -hmm. um, so um, in addition to the Army Corps of Engineers, an interagency review team reviews and comments on all of our in lieu fee projects and includes representatives from the State of Vermont Wetland Program, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the EPA, and the NRCS. And um, this in lieu fee mitigation program is funded through the Army Corps and um, to some extent state permitting um, as they can use it for certain projects. Um, and again, that's for um, impacts that cannot be avoided. So for example, a recent impact was um, uh, an airport that needed to um, expand the runway for safety. So trees were cut in the wetland, which wouldn't be under Army Corps jurisdiction, mm -hmm. but is under state jurisdiction. So a certain amount was um, uh, of credits were paid into the, the inland program for that. Um, so increased usage of this program, we would be in favor of. Uh, because it would allow us to get more restoration work on the ground. Um, there's already a program set up through the Army Corps um, that has very strict standards, and I'll go into that a little further. Um, I have a question here on this slide, if you're, sure. if you're finished. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little about what uh, um, administered by the Corps, and then, you know, we're getting a lot of input uh, from the state about needing more resources to oversee this Think changes made in this bill. Uh, there are a lot of people listed on that, and and I've been involved in some restoration projects in my time, and I, I'm wondering if there's any kind of evolution in um, not having every single administrative branch here represented at every project, and um, is there really a value added when they're all still there, kind of all these years later, um, working on each project? It's a lot of it seems like a lot of redundancy. Um, so I think that it is valuable to have everyone, they don't have to come to every meeting, but um, once or twice a year, usually twice a year, we'll have an interagency review team meeting. Mm -hmm. So it's about two hours long. Um, I think there are two wetland staff people there, but I think it's very important because they also pay into the, um, the program, use the program. Um, so it's important to have that input it's also, they have other experience, so we'll review projects. Um, the same with Fish and Wildlife Service, they're doing their own restoration work and in similar environments to where we're working. Um, so I, I think it's very important to have that input from them. And it's also required um, from the Army Corps to at least invite um, people. And even if they don't, come to the meetings, they can still um, review the projects and comments. Um, and then we take their comments into consideration with revising the mitigation plans. So it's fair to say they kind of control the purse strings on this and then different partners take the lead on different projects? No, so um, so Ducks Unlimited does all of the in lieu fee. You know, we're, um, when a permittee goes through the process and pays for a wetland credit per acre, um, we are accepting that responsibility forever for mitigating that impact. So we're responsible, but the Army Corps of Engineers um, has the final say on whether a project is approved or not and whether um, funding is released to pay for part of the project. Um, but otherwise, um, it, the the rest of the team is um, can contribute as much or as little as they like. Um, they're not, they don't take the lead on a certain project. They just have the opportunity to comment on all of our projects. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so, as I mentioned, when permittees purchase credits, um, they're transferring the liability to us. So we submit a letter um, saying that we accept responsibility for the mitigation, and then the permittee needs to provide that letter to the Army Corps before they can begin the project. Um, so once we, um, so that funding goes into an account, which is split up by watersheds. We have four service areas in Vermont. So there's the whole Lake Champlain watershed that by far has the greatest majority of credits and impacts. Um, there's also the Memphis Magog watershed um, and then the Connecticut River and then the Baton Kill, which goes to the Hudson. Um, so, um, work that happens or projects that happen in that watershed are funded, um, through impacts in those watersheds. Um, so, um, so a complete in loop site typically includes, um, uh, well, it always includes permanent section of the entire property. Um, so typically there's a mix, at least half of the property we purchase is existing wetlands that are conserved, um, preserved the way they are. Um, and then the restoration area is also permanently protected, but we um, have a restoration process um, leading up to that. Um, the Three Mile Bridge site in Middlebury, we transferred to Fish and Wildlife service um and when when they're interested in a property we typically will um donate the property to them following restoration we've also worked with other land trusts where we haven't been close to uh, a wildlife refuge or they weren't interested otherwise um so restoration occurs on lands that are currently upland but that were historically wetland um there's also rehabilitation of existing wetlands that have been disturbed by humans. So for example, a cornfield that was historically wetland that's wet. Um, uh, it's already it delineates as wetland, but we're improving the condition by um, improving the hydrology and planting trees and shrubs and native wetland vegetation versus corn or, um, or hay. And then restoration and rehabilitation both occur in areas that were previously drained or filled um, or affected by flooding. Um, and then there's a different ratio. So um, I'll give the Three Mile Bridge as an example. It's kind of a photo behind the text. Um, uh, that site is, I think it's about 140 acres, um, but 20 wetland credits were um, are likely to be generated from that site. Um, so it's definitely not a one-to-one -one ratio. It's um, a lot more um, land is conserved and restored based on the Army Corps guidance. <clears throat> this shows the um, Vermont and New York uh, in Luffy program. We work very closely together um, there's an office in Syracuse, you have equipment, um, like for no-till seeding and, um, and mowing. And, um, so they assist with field work and tree plantings and, um, but I cover Vermont and Eastern New York. So basically the Hudson Valley from finding sites all the way to, um, administering the construction project and we hire a local contractor to do the excavation. Um, typically we'll hire a nursery or other um, planting firm to do the initial um, tens of thousands of trees planting. Um, and then all the way through to um, 10 years of monitoring showing that the site meets the, um, the standards for a wetland and then it moves to the long-term management, which is less intensive. So this is our three mile bridge site in Middlebury, Vermont. Um, I'm uh, 
see. I've been following the, um, this area for the last few years. It's, it was constructed in 2018, um, and I completed the five-year monitoring report uh, this past winter, um, and it is available through the Army Corps site, um, available to the public for review, or I can send you a copy if you're interested um, to see how the site is progressing. And we are meeting all of the strict standards set by the Army Corps. Um, so the um, we have hydrological monitoring wells at various points. Um, this photo was taken in October 2013 um, when we were out planting trees. And um, the photo that Laura had shared earlier was from July. Um, so much of the late season, the, um, the pools and oxbows that were created held water and were functioning as planned. The river that you see is the Middlebury River. And um, shortly after it flows into the Otter Creek. Oh, and it is um, part of the Cornwall Swamp Wildlife Management Area. But we um, continue, we have five more years of adaptive management. So treating any invasives, replanting as needed to make sure that um, native vegetation is established. Um, our next project is the Otter Creek Twin Oaks property in Brandon. Um, so that's 169 acres that are protected, um, currently owned by Ducks Unlimited. Um, it's a proposed site. We recently submitted the restoration plan, so it's under review. Um, this shows the natural area, not the restoration area. But there's a, a large um, beaver wetland complex um, that will that is protected um, along the Otter Creek. Can't see the creek because there's a little berm on the side, but um, this is the actual restoration area. Um, so much of the area actually delineates as wetland. So it's a mix of restoration and rehabilitation. Um, so there's a, where you can see the tree line beyond the camp. Um, the camp will be removed during construction. There's a, a large deep ditch that is on that hedgerow. Um, so it'll be filled at certain points. Um, to increase hydrology in that area. And then um, we'll create the micro topography and um, plant trees and shrubs according to the plan. Um, there may be revisions based on comments we receive back, but that's the current plan. That's just showing a flooded part of the area that's flooded. Um, so then the Willoughby Lake Road in Luthi site is in Barton near Willoughby Lake. Um, and that we've protected 243 acres. Um, and then the mitigation plan is approved and construction is anticipated in 2025 or 26. So in the Memphis Magog watershed. And this is our most recent acquisition uh, on the Batten Hill in Sunderland, Vermont, just south of Manchester, where we purchased 128 acres. Um, we have a proposed in Luffy site. Um, it's a um, hay field that was for sale, slated for um, solar development, um, but we purchased the property. And there's a um, tile drain that's about 500 feet long that goes through the middle of the field. So part of the restoration project here will be um, interrupting that tile drain to restore the natural um, hydrology to the area. Um, and then creating micro topography. Um, we're maybe working with other environmental organizations um, to do some stream work as well, um, so woody habitat additions, and there are um, many active beavers on the site, so that will help um, keep the site progressing moving forward. Um, and then trees and shrubs, we 
planted here. So we haven't developed the mitigation plan for this yet, but will be this summer and winter. Um, and that's all that I um, that I have for presentation. This is the Three Mile Bridge site again, showing the um, plantings that we've done. Um, and just wanted to thank you so much for inviting me and for uh, taking up this bill. Um, Jackson Limited, um, we agree with, uh, with the wetland protection piece and with the uh, emphasis on restoration and increased ratio. Um, and we um, hope that the um, state will consider using the in lieu fee program um, that is with the Army Corps as that will help us to do more projects like this um, throughout Vermont. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for your testimony, um, Representative Smith. Thank you. Um, question for it. I know DU does an awful lot for uh, the wetlands around all parts of Vermont. And the Northeast Kingdom has always had a big, strong DU banquet, but they've kind of fallen away from that for the last couple of years. I've heard they're bringing, bringing one back. Do you know whether they are or not? I don't know, but I recently went to the um, Southeastern Vermont uh, banquet near Brattleboro, and that was revived since COVID. I think a lot of chapters um, couldn't, well, they couldn't do big, big events, it, you know, starting in 2020, obviously, and so they've had some trouble. Um, I know that volunteerism is the problem. Right, right. And we've, so um, luckily there is a revitalization. So I haven't heard about that specifically, but there are people that are getting engaged and stepping up and volunteering for the state chair position. And oh, for... well, they raise a lot of money and it's a lot of fun. So. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay. yeah I'm, I'm not a hunter myself, but it is hunting and conservation has done um, done a lot for Wetlands. Well, I do know that without the correct uh, response to taking care of wetlands, ducks and duck hunting and ducks unlimited probably will go away if it's not done right. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I have a question about the, your last picture and um, mm -hmm. when will you come and pick up the plastic tubes? Because I've uh, spent a fair amount of time as a volunteer removing them from other places that they were left for decades. <laughs> right. They don't really disintegrate as advertised. Yeah, so that is one of the, the great things about the in-loop fee program is that we actually have funding built in throughout the process for going back. So first of all, for monitoring. So every two years, um, we check the tree tubes. They're actually going out this um, next Saturday. Um, <laughs> our commission is meeting with volunteers to straighten tree tubes with uh, UVM students. So we spend a lot of time on the sites. Um, they will be removed by the end of the 10 year period. So once we show that the um, trees have, so we have to show that they have 50% um, canopy cover. So not just that the trees are surviving, but that within those 10 years, there's enough of a canopy to provide shade. Um, so it, with deer brows, it's really important that they have some protection, but a lot of the, the tree plantings that we did in the fall and um, that we're doing this fall with um, the Northwood Stewardship Center and the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, um, we've hired them to, um, to do plantings with us. And we now um, use, uh, I don't know what they're called, but they're stakes, basic live stakes. So they're um, chopped up um, alders and willows and different species that um, will sprout readily. Um, and many of them actually do pretty well. They're inexpensive. So you can just hammer them in yeah. and no tree tube. And because they're so inexpensive, you don't have to provide that intensive, um, the tree tubes and yeah, I mean, I guess I'd be curious about the efficacy of those, but I am also mm. concerned about time, so I can shake that offline. Thank you for your testimony. Sure, yeah. You're welcome. Uh, and I want to do a time check with the remaining witnesses um, 
Um, we have two more on wetlands. And one on dams. So Karina and Alaire, I guess I just need to understand time and make you aware that there's another witness that we need to hear from before lunch. So we don't need to hear a lot of uh, repeats on benefits of wetlands. I think we're clear on that. Uh, well, Alaire, I think she must be zooming in for it. So I can't speak to her like availability, but I can go and keep it short and sweet. Yeah, I mean, I don't need to force you. We still have an hour and 10 minutes. I just want to be clear yeah. about it. So um, please yeah. join, join yeah. us. And so how much time did you plan for? I have 12 slides. <clears throat> so I was thinking that I could get through them in about 15 minutes. Then we're um, fine. Then don't change anything. And it includes dams as well. So it's wetland right, granted. Right. Good morning. For the record, I'm Karina Daly, Restoration Ecologist with Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, thank you for inviting me here to speak today about wetlands and dams relative to S213, the Flood Safety Act. Um, my background, a little bit about me. I work for VNRC currently as a restoration ecologist managing the dam removal, derelict dam removal program for VNRC and working on water policy in the state. Prior to that, I was a professional consulting scientist, um, both in the Inner Mountain West and back in Vermont for the past 10 years, uh, working for a consulting firm called Trudell Consulting Firm in Wilson, Vermont. The flooding Vermont experience this past year made it clear that we need to take action to build resilience for our communities and environment. And the climate change will continue to intensify extreme weather events. Our natural infrastructure is our best defense um, for community resilience. And it is a far less expensive approach to mitigate flooding, ensure clean water and protect biodiversity. I'm going to keep drumming at home with every um, testimony, but intact freshwater systems build climate resilience. So we need to expand our thinking beyond the health of our lakes and our ponds and be thinking at the watershed scale. And S213 really does that because it includes a wetlands component and includes a river corridor component and it addresses our dams and how to deal with our failing dams. So using our wetlands to filter water, you've learned about that today, um, giving our rivers the space they need to move. Um, a big piece of this is um, a fundamental component to watershed science, and this graphic illustrates that. But rivers, wetlands, freshwater systems have four dimensions. And when they don't have those four dimensions, they are not functioning as a full system. So rivers need to move up and down. Wetlands, wetlands connect to rivers and they transport water, sediments, nutrients. So there's that longitudinal connection of a system. And when you put a dam in the middle of that system, you fracture that system and block the ability for that system to function longitudinally. Um, when you build along our river corridors or in our wetlands, you block the lateral connectivity. So the ability of that water to go into that depression and hold and attenuate flooding. When you build in a seep that's just bothering you and you don't want it there and you're wondering why it's there, that's a vertical connection, that's groundwater, that's like cold water that we need to connect to our wetland, to our river system. Um, so that's that vertical connection. We need our groundwater, we need our spring seeps, and we need them to connect to the wetlands, to the river system. You can sometimes walk along a river and suddenly it feels very cold where you're standing. That's like a direct groundwater connection. 
And then the, the fact that these um, systems change over time is the temporal dimension of watershed science. Um, they're, they're dynamic, they move, wetlands need to be redelineated every five years, rivers change banks um, and move with storm events. So, so they are a moving dynamic system. Um, the Flood Safety Act is an improved statewide approach to protecting our watersheds for public safety, to reduce the economic burden, provide community resilience, and improve water quality and habitat diversity. These yeah, aren't- yeah, Stebbins has a question. Thanks, MJ. Um, I'm just, that's the first time I've heard, ever heard it's that. It's getting renamed in the bill. What's that? The name? Uh, no, um, the, the comment about every five years, wetlands need to be redelineated. Is that like data-based, like science studies? And is that becoming shorter with increased flooding events and with the fact that we're seeing a hundred year flood occur more frequently or? Um, I haven't aware that they have changed that data set. So I don't know, it's a good question is who is tracking that, but the Army Corps of Engineers typically requires every five years, a new delineation. So delineations expire because of that dynamic nature of the wetland. So that's a, okay, so that's a regulatory requirement. Mm -hmm, it um, is. And when you look at those changes every five years, uh, is there a pretty significant difference? I think it depends on the, on the wetland, they're all different. So I think there can be that change, but I would say in my career, I have not seen a lot of changes. Okay, for time. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this slide is just to, I just wanted to point out that um, the Flood Safety Act addresses public safety, it reduces that economic burden, and it provides community resilience. And these are not new ideas. These are ideas, Lauren Oates said this in her testimony earlier, but they've been prioritized in the Vermont Climate Action Plan, the State Hazard Mitigation Plan, Vermont Conservation Design, and the Lake Champlain TMDL. So they all promote the protection of healthy, functioning, connected freshwater systems. Um, I'll be brief here because this has been covered with previous testimony, but the benefits, wetlands are those areas where land and water intersect. Um, we need to protect them for those functions that they provide to society at large, that stormwater storage piece Wetlands reduce peak stormwater flows, and this graph just, just shows that the, the nice round hit curve of the wetlands, and then that spike without the wetlands ability to attenuate floods. And that is the benefit of a net gain of wetlands, is to enhance that protection for the future. Um, we need to do a better job understanding our wetlands in Vermont. The state is doing great work with their mapping and we've identified a lot of wetlands that we didn't know existed before. Um, so that's excellent. Um, but we also, because we didn't have them mapped and didn't really know our baseline of what, what we were protecting, I, I know because I was a wetland scientist and saw this, but there was a lot of wetlands that have been disrupted and, you know, Laura mentioned we've lost a third of our wetlands since early, you know, European colonization, like late 1770s. Um, that is a significant loss. And, and that's only one data set or one report. So we really need to make up for lost wetlands. And we need to support um, DEC and the Army Corps and consultants and watershed organizations who are getting this work done on the ground. So we need to have the capacity. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, what role does FEMA play in all of this? Do they have the wetlands and the river corridors already mapped out? FEMA has the flood hazard um, inundation maps, but they do not have a role in wet if you know if there is a wetland that falls within that mapping yes then it would be subject to fema jurisdiction but there are wetlands that extend beyond that that would not fall under so are zone. there parts of this that we're redoing what fema has already done no okay good thank you and to be clear, you heard testimony from Laura notes about river corridors and flood inundation mapping. I will not be providing testimony on that, but 
Yes, as a freshwater system, they all are connected. So um, S213 has that net gain ratio of two to one impact, and the impact is prioritized in, in the watershed where the impact occurred. So the goal here is to restore the wetland function where the wetland was impacted. If that impact is of a, of a size, if it can't be avoided, number one, and it can't be mitigated, and if it's greater than 5,000 square feet, then we want to really work within that watershed, and it's at the Huck 8 level. So Huck 8 is, it's not like, it's not your Huntington River or your, I'm trying to think of some small rivers in your area, Mill Brook. This is at the Winooski or the Lamoille or the Missisquoi. So that's the Huck 8 level. So we're looking for the restoration to happen within that water, that watershed, which is a pretty big watershed. So there should be plenty of opportunity there. Um, currently, the work Ducks and Limited is doing, which is great work, is um, they're looking at the at Vermont as four watersheds. And so a lot of that work is happening in the Lake Champlain Basin and the Richelieu watershed. Um, additionally, the high quality mapping, the NWI mapping, um, that work is already happening. Since we wrote this policy, there was funding for that. That's great, but we want to put that in statute and codify that work and make sure it's ground truth and updated as it needs to be on a five-year basis. Um, as well as the Vermont Significant Wetlands Inventory Mapping, which will be updated annually, and um, reporting annual reporting to you related to the wetland loss and gain in a year. Um, and that gain would be including those two to one mitigation ratios, as well as five year deep, more detailed reporting on, excuse me, the results of the NWI mapping, um, permits issued, um, what those were for, and sort of a trend in what's happening statewide related to wetlands. Um, this slide just shows that this net gain work is already happening at the state level. Um, the report from between 2016 and 2020 showed 18.5 acres um, was gained in the state over that four year time period. And you can see also in the slide that that work is happening. It's not balanced, it's not equitable across the straight seat. So there's more um, gain in the Ruchelo River with the work Ducks Unlimited is doing and the St. Francis than the Connecticut and the Upper Hudson. This slide, um, as we transition from wetlands to dams, I just love this image of, um, this is a dam removal I did in a headwater wetland stream in Shrewsbury, Vermont last year. So this is an old earthen dam that was created. Um, NRCS supported these dams for water supply. So either for fire suppression or irrigation. And this dam was failing. It was 300 feet long. It's on the lower right hand corner of the screen um, and about 30 feet deep, thick. Um, so you could actually see from old imagery where the material was excavated out on the site to build the dam. So we took that, we breached the dam. This photo was taken before we took away the dam. There's all these trees that grew up on the dam. That's why the dam was failing. And it's right above Northam Road, which is a, a state-owned road. There's houses below it. Um, and its failure would have impacted potentially the house and the infrastructure of the road itself. So we had to do an emergency drawdown. And in doing that drawdown, these wetlands came alive because they were basically saturated as a pond for the past 75 years. Um, and as soon as the drawdown happened, you could see all these spring seeps coming in and feeding this headwater system. So that was really exciting. And then when we ended up opening the dam itself up, we put the soil back where it had been taken from and really tried not to mess too much with the natural channel evolution that was already happening within this system. What, what town did you say this is? Shrewsbury. Approximately that. Representative Clifford. Thank you very much. I can't hear you. I just can't hear you. Thank you very much. I'm just curious, is that close proximity to Salt Ash Mountain? I don't know Salt Ash Mountain. It was on Northam Road yeah. where there's like a sharp corner. Yes. That okay, so you're right, right on the left. Right. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> so dams. Dams are um, are aging in the state, and we're having a hard time keeping up with their infrastructure. There's over a thousand dams in the state, um, many of which are derelict and no longer serve their useful purpose. And we feel that you know a removed dam is the safest safest dam because it's really getting hard to maintain these dams. They cost money. They're a liability to landowners and they put neighbors at risk, um, or public safety risk when they are failing and no one is maintaining them. They also disrupt um, the river continuum. This is, this is a scientific concept, basic concept of a river. So river, a natural function of a river, I spoke to this earlier, they move, water moves down the system, sediment moves down the system, nutrients, wildlife need to move up and down that system. And when you block that system, you change the habitat. So you, you put a barrier in the stream, the sediment builds up behind that barrier because it can't go down the system and feed the lower, lower river system. And the temperature changes, so it warms up behind that dam. And the fish change, you have bass and sunfish. You don't have the cold water fish species that Vermont is known for in its streams. So you, you really change a river into a lake-like system. Um, you have less dissolved oxygen, you have less turbidity. These are things that cold water fish species and rivers need to function. Um, Representative Smith. Yes. Do, do any of these dams have the potential to generate power? Um, they Well, not efficiently, and it, often it's the, the benefit of the power. It's not providing enough power for the cost and the impact, the ecological impact. So, so there's a trade-off there. So it's kind of pointless to have those dams there then? Exactly. You know, the state and this committee has been well, trying to they... generate uh, non-fossilized power. And water power is the way to do it. If these dams are useful to create power, we would think we would utilize them. Well, and they, and they did provide that purpose at one point in time. They were old mill dams um, when we needed that power. We, our, our energy has evolved and we don't, that power is no longer an efficient way nor ecologically, environmentally sound way to provide power. These, these, that's why they were abandoned. So these dams have been abandoned. They haven't maintained. You would have to rebuild them and, and, and no one is willing to put that investment in, and it's the ecological risk of what it does to the river system okay. itself. So I think, to be clear, Karina's talking about a subset of dams, right? So we do have hydroelectric dams still. Okay. And these are ones that have been abandoned. That, that, yeah. These are what we're calling yeah, the derelict dams. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is that. Okay. You see it. This is a project. This is a derelict dam in Northfield on the Dog River, um, right behind Dollar General. And this dam um, used to be about 50 feet higher. They actually blasted it in the 70s to lower the flood elevation for the town during before a storm of event. Um, we just received funding that last week from FEMA. It's been in the works. The application was submitted four years ago through the hazard mitigation grant program for this project. Um, removing this dam based on our preliminary engineering studies will lower the flood of elevation for 10 homes within the 100 year floodplain. So that's a substantial flood reduction measure of this dam removal, which is um, uh, the, the cost opinion for this project is a million dollars versus buying out two homes can cost $2 million is what I heard in testimony earlier. So we're lowering the flood elevation by two feet for 10 homes with this dam based on preliminary engineering. Um, so that's that's significant and a real benefit. What is this in? Northfield. This is Cross Brothers Dam. Um, and related to that, I just wanted to speak a little bit to the difference between flood control dams and um, 
and other dams because we I think there was a little bit miscommunication during the flood events that we had in 2023 mm -hmm. related to that. There are only eight flood control dams in the state and three in this area, Waterbury Reservoir, Berlin, um, and I'm missing one. Well, Wrightsville, thank you. <laughs> That's the most important one um, in this area. But those dams are, are managed for flood control. They were built for flood control to protect um, the towns that we built close to the river. And they are dredged regularly to remove that sediment that builds up behind them to create storage for flooding. So that capacity. A lot. The rest of the dams in the state are not managed for flood control, and they are not designed to serve that purpose. So there's a big difference in understanding. So two percent of our dams are for flood control. Um, not all dams serve that purpose. In fact, many of the dams and most of, all of the derelict dams are no longer managed. They've been abandoned, and that sediment builds up so high behind them that it raises the water level when a storm comes through and exacerbates flooding. So I think that's a really important point that I just wanted to share. So the policy in S213 related to dam safety um, includes an unsafe dam petition. So making it easier for the dam safety program to address those failing dams um, and um, make sure they are maintained or on a plan for removal with a dam order. Um, it improves the inspection of dams. It improves, it provides a dam safety revolving loan fund um, to, to provide funding for dam removal and dam repair, um, both in emergency and non-emergency situations based on the hazard rating. And it transfers jurisdiction of dams from the PUC to, um, to dam safety, the DEC. So right now we have this split jurisdiction of dams in Vermont. These are dams. So the federal federal regulatory FERC um, commission manages all hydropower dams in the state. Other than in Vermont, we have some dams that were before FERC. Um, so these dams are the ones that the PUC is managing and um, for power, which makes sense, but they don't have the engineers to um, perform the inspections and they don't have the experience that dam safety does to manage these dams in an efficient way. So it, it is ineffective to have this juris the split jurisdiction of dams. So one of the things we're hearing about is the timeline for when that transition should happen. Can you speak to that? I know it was, it's um, getting different recommendations. I'm going to defer for, for further um testimony on that. I think I think that it should happen sooner rather than later, personally. Um, I know that there's concern about there's a concern about timing and just with the flooding, there's a lot right now happening at Dan Safety. They have a lot to respond to. They had to do a lot of inspections. But I'm hoping that we can provide them with the capacity and funds to to take that on. We'll, we'll talk about it later. Yeah. Chris. Smith. Thank you. I heard you mention dredging around the dams. Do you feel that dredging is is good in some cases for flood control? I think if you have a flood control dam that was built for that purpose and you're dredging behind it, that is pro you know providing that function for that dam. What do you feel about dredging upstream from dams? I think it just puts the pressure downstream. So it's just pushing the problem to the next neighbor. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And lastly, there's a study committee on dam emergency operations that's part of the dam safety policy. And I think with that, I'll stop. Hopefully I wasn't too long. Any question, any other question? You have a question? No, I actually saw the answer on the slide. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do members have further questions? Thank you for your testimony. Yeah. And we do have Alaire Diamond by Zoom. Welcome, Alaire. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person today. And let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. Okay, great. Well, um, Karina, I just caught kind of the 
the last maybe 15 minutes or so of your presentation. So um, I'm here to, that was some, some great overview for me as well on S213. Um, I'm not as familiar with it as um, as Karina is, of course, but I am just here to talk about um, Vermont Land Trust and some of the ways that our work, um, conserving working lands, intersects with the goals of the bill um, and so how some of our projects on that relate to river corridors, um, floodplains, wetlands, and with dams um, just are integrated through our conservation work around the state. Um, we do support S213. Um, and are, are excited about the, many of the opportunities that are available through that. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I'm just going to walk through a couple stories, um, a, get a little bit of background on Vermont Land Trust. I know that I've, I've been in um, committee before with you all. So I have the first couple slides are probably some review, but just wanted to share it quickly. And then telling a couple stories about conservation projects um, where we have been able to work on all of these elements, wetlands, floodplains, river corridors, um, and dams, um, all in the context of farms in Vermont. Um, and I think I just want to emphasize throughout this presentation that um, farmland, and especially conserved farmland because of the nature of that permanent conservation easement, um, these, these lands are just wonderful places for us to be able to implement um, water quality and restoration work. They contribute hugely to um, flood resilience, climate resilience, um, when we're able to work with the, the farmers um, who are amazing stewards of that land um, and then also be able to bring resources to those lands through our work, um, being able to access um, funding through DEC and through other sources um, and just make these conserved lands even more impactful, um, not only producing um, you know, great food, um, local food um, or timber, but also contributing to climate resilience in our state. Um, and the opportunities there are just even bigger than I think we've even been able to imagine. Um, there's a lot of kind of big projects that I'm working on um, that really can even more, more fully maximize the impact of farmland and working forest land um, for water quality and climate resilience. All right, I'm going to share my screen and walk through this. Are you all able to see my screen? We are. Yeah, great. OK. Um, so this this image is um, of a wetland complex on West Farm on the Brewster Uplands property in Cambridge, um, Vermont Land Trust. Um, as I've shared with you before, our mission is, is to help people protect, care for, and connect with the land that we love in Vermont. Um, you know, we're 47 years old. We just had our birthday um, earlier this month. I think on Sunday was our our day of incorporation. Um, we've conserved 11% of Vermont, over 630,000 acres. Um, we steward over 2,300 um, easements on farms, forests, and community lands. We have a, over 3,500 members. Um, funding from VHCB, from the state, federal sources, foundations, and individuals, and 45 employees. And our restoration and ecology work um, is the component that I'm here to talk about. Um, I lead our, our ecology and restoration program. Um, so since our inception, we have protected um, almost 63,000 acres of wetlands and uncommon natural communities, um, conserved land along 3,400 miles of rivers, streams, lakes, and ponds. Um, and we've restored wetlands and streams. We've removed dams, improved stream crossings. Um, and planted tens of thousands of trees. And we do this all in coordination with our partners. We have just a, an amazing network of partners here in the state um, that we can work on, um, work on these projects with. This photo is um, a student from UVM who's transplanting an ostrich fern to a dam removal and wetland restoration site in Colchester that I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, so UVM is one of our partners. We work with conservation districts, um, watershed groups around the state, um, other, you know, VNRC and the Nature Conservancy, private consultants, and just really grateful to have the network of um, practitioners and researchers here to, to be able to do even better work. Um, I shared a little bit about this project um, when I testified on um, VHCC Day back in February, but I just wanted to bring up just two slides about it again. This is the Josh Boysenow Farm in St. Albans. And when Karina, I just heard you say that 18 acres of wetland had been added to the state in between 2016 and 2020, um, which is really exciting to hear that those kind of statistics. Um, one of the ways that we can 
add wetland is through conserving farmland and then retiring marginal wet previously converted agricultural land, um, restoring it back to a wetland condition. And this farm um, on Hathaway Point in St. Albans, you can see in the right hand photo, the lake on both sides of that narrow peninsula um, in St. Albans, the farm makes up the bulk of the of the peninsula, except for the two narrow bands of, of summer homes, uh, mostly summer homes on either side, um, the lakefront property. Um, and there's a huge wetland complex there that is really important in terms of flood when the, you know, the when the lake level rises because of high water um, that's flowing into it from the rest of the state, from the basin, um, this is one of the wetland complexes that really can absorb some of that water um, before it goes down to the lake and then also moderate the, the, the flow um, and hold it. Uh, provides incredible um, diversity of plants and animals. There are some rare plants and animals that occur here. Um, but what's really exciting to me is when we conserve this land um, we, in 20, 2019, um, we not only conserved you know, the natural wetland that you can see in that sort of like brown cover, color on the left, um, but also about, um, I always forget if it's 14 or 18 acres, but we'll say 14 just to be conservative. Um, the land that's in sort of under the words uh, north unit. And that was some really marginal pasture land. Um, Josh Boyceno, who conserved the land, agreed to retire that land and have it be restored to wetland. We worked with partners at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do that work. And you can see on the right um, that there was, they created um, some depressions where water can, can sit after flowing off of the cornfields over here to the right, um, plugged some ditches, planted trees, and um, over the last couple of years, it's been really fun to see that wetland really return to life. Um, the diversity in it is amazing. There's there's trees, there's willow shrubs, there's milkweed, um, swamp milkweed and monarch butterfly caterpillars. Um, and it's just really fun to see that. So this particular project, um, you know, the goal was kind of to go from, this is a, a photo on the left of the natural, part of the natural wetland and on the right is, um, some of the restoration work to create some of those ditches and wetland um, features um, adjacent to that area. So over time, we hope that this kind of dry field will become something more like this beautiful um, maple ash swamp that you see on the left. Um, there's a swamp milkweed with the, the monarch caterpillar that started to grow after the land was um, was taken out of agricultural production. So just a great way to see that farms and natural wetlands can really coexist with each other. And actually um, farmland is a place where we can really achieve some of those wetland restoration goals. Um, the fact that it's protected by a permanent conservation easement makes any of that work. Um, it just, it's like an insurance policy on it um, because now that area that we've retired and restored is protected as a wetland zone on that conservation easement. So it can't be converted back, um, even if the landowner went through like necessary permitting to do that. Um, the easement would not allow that. Going to shift to another project. Um, this, this one involves a stream, a dam, and wetlands. Um, this is in Colchester um, along Route 7, um, photo from 1954. Um, shows Route 7 um, here, that road going through. This is the button farm. And then on the right, you can see there's a little pond and there's some paths for, from cows, um, you know, walking down from the water up to their barn, um, completely open. There's not a barely, a, there's not a tree in sight around this pond. Um, this is an artificial pond that was created by damming Crooked Creek um, in, the, in the 1940s or early 1950s. A couple more pictures. This is, a, this is the dam. The dammed um, area, the impounded area, looking up to that barn, there's some cows. And this is an aerial photo from 1962 um, with the current Crooked Creek um, stream layer, the blue line going through it. So you can see the valley, it's flowing north. So it's kind of going toward the top of the frame. Um, the, the valley is just an open pasture. This was like a marginal pasture um, because it was steep and, and wet, <laughs> um, but cows were able to be there. My understanding is they were there at night. Um, once the farm um, stopped being a dairy farm and the cows were sold, the area did grow back, started to grow back to forest. And this is a, a photo from 2021 looking downstream. So there's that that impounded area. The dam um, is that sort of brown covered sort of straight area in the middle. And then you can see a forest, mostly white pines kind of extending to the north. Um, 
And this is integrate the the farm fields that you see sort of on the sides of this photo are just incredibly productive. Um, really, um, they've they're now actually vegetable fields, uh, a combination of hay and and vegetables. Um, and just there's truckloads of produce leave this farm every year to go to um, the African diaspora communities, both in Vermont and throughout you know much of the United States. So it's an incredibly productive farm. Also has an amazing opportunity for restoration um, and dam removal, which is what Vermont Land Trust has been doing. We are a co-owner of this farm um, with Gene Button, so we are we worked with him um, and came up with. Um, working with um, a local engineering company, um, hydro a hydrological consulting slash engineering company, Fitzgerald Environmental, um, to develop a design for removing the dam and restoring wetland there. Um, this is just a sort of a, a photo to show the, <laughs> the complexity of the project. I'm not gonna get too into it, into that photo, but show you more just images. Um, basically this, the process involved, you know, breaching the dam. Um, you can see it's all made of earth. The dam is this is this photo is taken from downstream and above, um, looking kind of at that impoundment. This sort of like open dirt area is the dam itself. And at the beginning of the project, when it was beginning to be removed, um, it had been drained. Water was flowing out. Um, once the area was dry enough to work in, um, our construction partners came in and removed it. Um, and then used the material that, that the dam had been built with um, to recreate a wetland, um, a headwater wetland complex upstream to recreate a stream channel and some some um, depressions where water could could um, settle. This picture is a couple of weeks after that construction was finished um, in 2021. So this bright green area is where the dam actually was. It's been reseeded with grasses, native grass mix. The other there's a large stream channel that's about 25 to 30 feet wide um, going up through the middle of the frame. Um, and this is a is a headwater wetland, um, sorry, a headwater stream that is intentionally constructed to be really wide so that water um, during flooding events can actually spread out across that channel rather than being concentrated in a narrow channel where it would then be um, more likely to cut downward and erode, which is the problem that we were seeing in this valley. This is why we decided to do this project. Um, so we we intentionally created this very broad channel. This is very similar to what a natural headwater wetland would look like, although it wouldn't look this raw. It would have all kinds of alders and willows and trees, ferns in it. Um, but just wanted to show you this picture of kind of the scale of it immediately after construction finished. So the excavators had just left a couple of weeks before. Um, this is a crew from Vermont Youth Conservation Corps who had been um, out doing some planting. You can see this brown kind of pool on the left is um, one of the wetland depressions. It's brown because it's the, the sediment that had built up behind the dam was just so fine, so silty. And there was a lot of clay in it too that it just took, take, it's a long time to settle out. So it was still actually doing that. Um, now you go out there and the, and the water's clear. Um, there's frogs and, um, and birds, and it's just a really interesting place to see. Um, but importantly, this <clears throat> effort also included um, the placement of all of this wood, this natural wood, to try to not only hold the grade of the stream so it wouldn't, um, again, wouldn't cut down and erode, um, but also to slow the water. And so when you think about a natural headwater wetland or a headwater stream system, it's full of, it's really messy, right? It's full of trees that have fallen in and it's and just like hummocks of root wads from trees that fell in 20 years ago. Um, all of that slows down the water, spreads it out into the floodplain. You have this incredible floodplain function um, and that's high in the watershed on these tiny headwater streams, keeps the water from going down and um, causing more damaging flooding. Um, lower down. So this is what we intentionally tried to build in this setting. Um, this is a photo just from like in that system. You can see that there's some some wood. This is all wood that we sourced from the property. Um, you see cattails that are starting to grow in this this photo I love because it was taken right after a um, you know heavy rainstorm when there was quite a bit of water in the stream and you can see how the water is just moving down and flowing in kind of a sheet like form over these logs like this there's one that's kind of right here instead of just like powering through like it's in a pipe in a plumbing system it's actually spreading out it's getting slowed down it's like hitting all this natural uh, material and there's all these natural um, native wetland plants there's a plant called tick seed cattails there's a sensitive fern over here so really great to see this this area just starting to respond and it's even more um more diverse now that we've had a couple of years since the construction occurred um in this 
this is a, another photo actually from the same property where we've been doing some work on um, creating what we call beaver dam analogs. So um, as you're familiar with how beavers really can create natural um, natural dams that are they're very they function very differently from those earthen dams in terms of being able to allow cold water to keep going through, continuing to um, promote the groundwater um, inflow, inflow um, but also slowing and spreading the water out. So we have tried to jumpstart this process in this system by building some sort of fake beaver dams. They're nowhere near as beautiful and cool and complex as natural ones, um, but we're doing that with natural wood, with willow stems, um, with earth, and um, yeah, just like herbaceous plants that we can find. Um, this is one way that we, you know, we're recognizing the, the really positive impact that beavers have in terms of our wetland systems and our river systems. And then we're trying to mimic that and also potentially attract them to the site um, by doing this kind of restoration work. Um, Vermont Land Trust also does work with beaver coexistence. Um, so this is a, um, a beaver deceiver. Um, so a, a structure that is meant to protect a culvert um, from beavers damming it and also allow beavers to continue to function and live in the wetland system and do all the good work that they do. Um, so this is the same wetland that the opening slide that I started with, it's that same complex. There's a ton of beaver dams, very healthy beaver population. Um, this kind of structure is allows us to be able to um, keep those beavers on the land, um, not have to resort to trapping them and allowing them to continue to protect the, protect the downstream um, resources that we have um, while also protecting like culverts and our own roads and infrastructure. And yeah, this is just another aerial photo of that same complex that I just showed you um, where that beaver deceiver was going in. So here, this is the, you can see this blue pond in the kind of upper right. Um, that's the pond that the beaver deceiver is in. And then if you go upstream from it, um, kind of follow this backward, follow my cursor backward, um, you can see a beautiful beaver dam right here. Um, and there's a, a bunch more of them on the same property. This is West Farm um, at Brewster Uplands in Cambridge. And so the farm field over here on the left is, is a part of a hay field. Um, West Farm also grows a lot of vegetables and fruits, um, not fruits, but vegetables <laughs> um, that are mostly um, used for food security. So these are um, sold or donated to food banks um, around the state so people can have um, affordable or free um, healthy local food. Um, I want to share another project with you. Another, it actually happens to also be in Cambridge and Underhill. Um, this is Valley Dream Farm where we have done, Vermont Land Trust has had a conservation easement on the land since 1996, but just in the, um, 2022, um, or sorry, 2023, we put a river corridor easement on top of that original conservation easement. The original easement did not have any wetland or stream protections in it. So we worked with um, with DEC, with Department of Environmental Conservation to put together um, this river corridor easement. The red in the image is the actual mapped river corridor. And I know S213 has some provisions around river corridor mapping. Um, and that, so within that red area, um, the landowners at Valley Dream Farm now need to allow the river, in this case, it's the Seymour River, which is a tributary of the Lamoille. Um, they need to allow that river to move. They need to maintain a 50 foot buffer. They're not allowed to put um, armoring on the banks of the river. And it just needs to be able to flood and function um, in its natural way. So I think we're all uh, familiar with the practice, which makes a lot of sense from a farmer's perspective, the historical practice of channelizing um, streams and rivers so that they would not flood and that they would flow off the land more quickly. Um, we know now through the last couple of years and just seeing it in person that that's not a very, um, it doesn't, it makes floods worse. Um, it might protect one piece of land, but it actually makes the downstream impacts a lot worse. It makes the water flow faster with a lot more power. So doing these river corridor easements is one way that we can relax the impact of those floods um, by allowing the river to just be able to flow out into the fields um, more naturally. What's really exciting about this project um, is that along with that river corridor and the 50 foot wooded buffer that is, is part of it, um, there's all of these white areas that you see um, these are all wetlands. Um, they're floodplain wetlands and headwater wetlands that are also on the property. They're all connected to each other and to the river. And that river corridor easement also includes protections for those. So 
again, this was a, we've retired, I think, seven and a half acres of wetland on this farm through this easement. Um, again, land that was not productive for the farm. It was wet all the time. It couldn't be worked. Um, and the landowners were able to get some compensation for retiring that land. Um, and then we are now able to get in and do some restoration if we need to. Some of these wetlands are natural. They're in beautiful shape. Others are, um, they're, again, they were retired from agriculture. And so they'll take some time. They might need some planting or some other work. Um, this is a really new project for us. We're going to have two and a half acres of land in this wet of wetlands and riparian buffer planted this um, this spring. Where um, I just want I need to do a time check because we have sure. another that we need to get to before lunch. Okay, so I need to um we get a, we need to wind down a little. Okay, I'm almost done, so <laughs> that works for me too. Um, this is just a photo of one of those wetland areas. You can see a bunch of willows in the background. Um, that er this area has been retired now. Um, this is the landowner, Joe Tisbert. You might know him as the president of the Vermont Farm Bureau. Um, really supportive and interested in retiring wetlands. This is a natural um, alder swamp that is part of that project. Um, a picture of the Seymour River in its more natural state um, in the upper parts of the property. And then lower down on the property, this is just this winter, um, there actually was a lot of um, change in the river. Um, you can see the farm fields beyond and some trees that got knocked in. And so we're working with Joe and DEC to think about how to um, how to approach this in terms of them not actually, them being able to maintain um, the buffer um, because we're seeing that some of the trees that were actually really, these mature trees that were in the buffer have actually been lost into the river, but they're producing all this natural structure, which is creating some interesting um, river dynamics. And I think that's it. Yep. So if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to take them now or you're you're welcome to reach out to me later. Hey, thanks for your testimony. Do members have questions? I'm not seeing any. Thanks for joining us and, and taking the time to testify. Thanks. All right, Scott Johnstone. Couple glasses on. I'm getting old. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you so much for having me in today. Um, perhaps because I'm old, I don't have any technology with me to share with you. I'll just uh, speak with you. And I'm here to talk specifically about um, a request we have to add some language to S213, which I'll dive into here in a minute about um, really getting a study that's already underway completed um, uh, to move some things along relative to the Green River Reservoir. Before I do that, though, just a, a brief introduction and, and then some background of why we're here to make this request of you. Um, again, I'm Scott Johnstone, and I'm the, both the general manager of Morrisville Water and Light, um, which operates three utilities uh, for that broader region of the state, and also the manager of the village of Morrisville, which is a duly chartered municipality in Vermont around 1870, late 80s, 70s, early 80s. Um, the village was chartered specifically uh, to create renewable energy. Um, that's why the village exists. We started out um, with uh, our first dam, which went into operation in 1895 um, and has created renewable energy ever since. Um, long before we knew the term was renewable energy, uh, we were doing it. Um, and it's been wonderful for our community and is to this day uh, as, as part of that work. Uh, my background is uh, I'm an engineer by training, a professional engineer by vocation, and really became a policy wonk somewhere along the way. So um, I've had the great honor to be this first the deputy secretary and then the secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources during the Dean administration. And the other stop along my way, you may know something about, at least one of your members certainly do, was I had the great honor to be the executive director of Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, which runs Efficiency Vermont for about a decade. So. Um, so I come at this with some background. I spent a lot of time with your previous committees and up, upstairs back when you were up there and have enjoyed that time greatly. Um, a little bit of background on the Green River Reservoir as I get to this question. So uh, as background, the, the Green River Reservoir Dam was built in the 1940s and it actually was built as a flood control dam and continues to serve that function to this day. We operate it to help protect all the way from Hyde Park through Johnson all the way down to Lake Champlain. Um, uh, and we did so last uh, summer as well. In the 1980s, a hydroelectric station was added. Um, 
Uh, it was intended to be a a, a day to day dam. Um, uh, there's less water there than I that flows in. The reservoir itself is huge, but there's less water that flows in. So it's mostly what's called a peaker plant. So when when the dirtiest electricity is coming onto the grid, that's when that runs. And when power is the most expensive, that's when that runs. Um, that requires some fluctuation. In 2009, we started re-permitting for our FERC license, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, uh, permit, as well as a 401 water quality certificate with the Agency of Natural Resources. We're still in that process 15 years later. Um, in 2016, the state issued their water quality certificate, and we've been appealing it ever since, which I'll get into in a minute. In 2021, it became apparent that we likely weren't going to have a way to successfully run that dam, and I'll explain why in a minute. And we sought for the state to take over ownership since it supports the state park. Um, uh, in 2022, in March of 22, you all, well, your predecessors, for many of you, um, authorized funding in the Budget Adjustment Act in March um, to have the state look at what it, uh, the safety of the dam and what it would take for the state to own that dam. Um, that study has just started. In fact, this year you authorized more money for that study, which has just started, and that's largely why I'm here. Um, a couple of weeks ago, after all this time, we came to the conclusion that we were going to need to surrender our FERC license at some point. Um, so we filed a notice. You might have seen our press release. Uh, where we filed a notice that we intend to surrender our permit and stop generating power at some point, because honestly, there's just no sustainable path forward. Um, uh, much as I'd like to continue generating at Green River Reservoir, it just isn't going to make sense. And then um, today, the study that you authorized over two years ago has just started, and there's no timeline and there's no concurrence on it that you'll even get to see the report that you funded. Um, and honestly, if we're going to surrender that um, that license, we need we need you to see it, and we need us to see it, so we can decide if it makes sense for the state to own that dam and support the state park. Um, so, how we got here is really the water quality permit that was issued um, is just simply unworkable. Uh, based on my time at, uh, as Secretary of Natural Resources, I can tell you that. It's not based on the Clean Water Act, which is what you'll hear often. The Clean Water Act hasn't been reauthorized since 1992. The Clean Water Act is the same today as it was when I was secretary. So I know, and I relicensed a lot of dams when I was secretary. So it's not required, and uh, as I'll share in a minute, the ANR actually agrees with that. And as a result, we, that permit for a flood control dam allows no fluctuation in the level of the dam, which is required to have a peaker plant and is required for flood control. So if you have a if, if you have a facility that requires some fluctuation and you can't do it anymore, then you don't have the ability to operate the dam anymore. That's why we've continued to try to appeal the permits and are still trying to appeal the permits. Um, that makes the economics horrible, and it actually requires more spill water and light to emit more greenhouse gases because if we can't, when the day comes, we can't operate it as a peaker plant. Um, and since we're still on appeal, we're still on the old permit. Um, We'll be buying the last power used in New England off the off the off the grid, which is what you have to do, which is when coal and oil get turned on. So this water quality permit actually requires more greenhouse gas emissions, um, which seems contrary to the interest of our region. It requires about fifteen million dollars worth of upgrades um, to the facilities uh, to generate about half of the power. Um, so it shouldn't be shocking to hear when I say it's uneconomic. That's basically the genesis of that statement um, uh, as, as we think about that. I've noticed since we put our press release out that there's been a lot of social media talk that that 15 million is for deferred maintenance. We're required to have a FERC mandated dam safety study every three years. We've passed every dam safety study. We're doing one while the state is finally getting started with their study. We're, we're doing our next um, FERC study this summer at the same exact time. And it can't be combined for some reason that we can't understand. Um, and uh, so the, there is no deferred maintenance on that facility. And 15 million is new cost because of the permit. Um, Can I just, uh, two things. One, will you be able to provide written testimony? Yeah. And the other is if you could 15 million in upgrades to generate half the power, if you were not limited to half the power, would the dollars work? I'll hit that in a minute, but. Marginally, yes. If we combine this with our other two dams, we could have made it a go of it. I'm going to explain what we tried to negotiate here in a minute, but 
Um, but yes, it could have worked, um, but we haven't got there. Um, so yeah, so, so at the end of this, if we're, if we're gonna surrender the license, we end up with a facility that has two purposes left. One is for flood control that I already talked about, which really, um, just as with Wrightsville and Waterbury, the state um, manages for that purpose. And the second is to support the Green River State Park. Um, it doesn't make sense at that point for 4,000 customers in Morrisville to support a facility that appeals to all of Vermont, all of New England and beyond um, as an incredible wildlife experience. We all want it to stay. We're not here saying it should come down. We actually don't think it should. It's important for both of those reasons. Uh, it's unfair to suggest once we can't generate power that 4,000 customers have to pay the cost to take care of it at that point, in our opinion. I've only been the general manager there for about a year and a half. And when I got there with my background, I thought surely since I knew we didn't violate the Clean Water Act, there must be a way to come up with a settlement. So I spent the last year and a half trying to do just that. Um, and this is where I'll get to your answer. Um, the premise that I went to ANR with to begin with was that we all agreed up front that whatever we came up with is not gonna violate any federal or state law, rule or regulation. That, um, for me, that's table stakes because of my background. I wouldn't be part of it if it didn't. Um, we went through that process and at the end of that process, um, and our leadership agreed that we had, that what we proposed met that test. Um, then they did an odd thing and they said, but well, we're not gonna sign on to it unless you can get all the environmental groups to sign on to it as well. And, and we're not gonna use our convening power to help make that happen. Um, which didn't shock me having run nonprofits before to know if you ask a nonprofit how much mission they want to accomplish, they'll say as much as I can accomplish. And that's what they should say. So this is not fault on their side. Um, not surprisingly, knowing that ANR wouldn't convene in the, the environmental groups wouldn't even come to a room and meet, um, which I didn't expect them to, honestly. Um, they refused to even have a conversation. Um, so all of this, um, leads us to a place where there, you know, even though there's, there was a way forward, in our opinion, um, uh, based on the economics I did of what we proposed for a settlement, uh, there's a way to continue to do all of the above, um, but there's no prospect um, and no hope going forward that you can beneficially generate anything there. Um, you know, honestly, the draft water quality permit wouldn't even allow us to have done what we did last summer, which is draw down the reservoir in anticipation of the floods. Um, we've got it about three feet lower than normal, and we held back all of that water from the peak that hit Johnson and everybody else. That should continue whoever is running that dam. Our permit wouldn't allow it. Um, the state could certainly do what they needed to do like they did at Wrightsville and like they did at Waterbury. Um, so just another reason why it should happen. So at the end, for me, this is a sad story that has played out because it didn't have to be, but we finally are at our place. It's, it's, it's interesting to me that the term of art FERC uses when you want to stop generating is that you surrender your license, because that's honestly how it feels. It feels like we're surrendering. Um, and But I got to tell you, we're a small utility. Like um, We have very few staff, and um, other than me, almost no professional staff. We've got to get ready to meet um, what, what you just passed for res, and our integrated resource plan says we're going to do it in, by the time you, before you actually just passed. Um, and, and I've got to find a different way to deal with peak power other than taking dirty um, power off the electric grid, which for me means I've got to put a five megawatt battery on our system. And I can't be fighting a rear guard on something that's 15 years old and trying to do what you're asking me to do, including get ready for about a $20 million investment to, to be ready for strategic electrification, which we subscribe to and endorse as well and have put in our integrated resource plan already that's sitting in front of the Public Utility Commission. So we are full bore on meeting all the directions that you've set as policy, but we keep, we have to surrender on Green River Reservoir. And that means really the state needs to own it. So the ask is really simple. Um, you authorized this study two years ago, you just authorized more money for it and it has just gotten started. We need, in order to finish surrendering, um, we need the results of that study and we need them to be made public so that we can move this thing along and surrender our license and get on the business. Um, honestly, for us, emotionally, having been in this business for 130 years, 
we'd like to tear their bandaid off as quick as we can and have the state own that thing because um, it's painful for our community to, to consider not uh, to give up a hydroelectric plant that ought to keep running. So um, we're simply asking that you add a sentence or two in this bill. We can provide language if it'd be helpful that requires the Agency of Natural Resources to finish that study and submit it to you by the end of this calendar year. Um, I believe that's about what their timeline, which hasn't been published with their contractor, says the, when they'll be done. Um, we don't have that confirmed, but that's the intimation we've had. And it's funded with public funds. It ought to come to you. It ought to come to us, and it ought to get done in a timely way. Then we can move on with, um, with our FERC filing, the rest of our FERC filings to surrender the license and hopefully move this into state ownership. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks. Um, I am obviously curious about the, you're saying there's some ambiguity about whether or not it would be publicly available. Um, <clears throat> I guess why wouldn't it be the, the report? I don't know, but when others have asked them, I know that the Senate took this up and it, in, a, in a bill that they passed it, they agreed to give it to Morrisville Water and Light, but not the legislature, they, the agency. So that's the way that that got written. Members have questions? Representative Pat. Uh, not a question. I, I, have, I have some things I need to say because I've actually been involved in this long before Scott Johnson was as a legislator. Um, uh, I, this was first brought to my attention when I was first elected in 2017. I started meeting with a succession of secretaries of ANR. It was Deb Markowitz um, uh, at that time and commissioners in the department, one of whom happens to now be the manager of the utility I, I used to run. Um, but uh, it was very clear to me at that point that if, if it was not viable, uh, right or wrong, but if it was not viable to run as a generating station, then it should not be the responsibility of a publicly owned or any any electric uh, uh, utility. Uh, and and whether it's for the um, flood control purpose or for preserving that incredible resource of the Green River State Park, um, uh, both um, in the public interest, then that is a public responsibility and not the responsibility of the utility. In our other uh, with our other hat on in this committee around energy issues, we've sometimes mentioned the phrase that the Public Utility Commission uses in reviewing a utility's rates, which is that all of its costs must be used and useful. That's a fundamental phrase in utility rate making. If, if, if right or wrong, if they can't generate electricity, then the cost that would be incurred by them uh, in maintaining the dam uh, would not be used and useful, and the PUC should not allow that in their rates. Um, so what? That's 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 what's uh, confronted here. So, it's in, so I'm just going to finish by saying it's been incredibly frustrating that the Agency of Natural Resources, and I've spoken with other secretaries since Deb Markowitz, including Secretary Moore. Um, it's been incredibly frustrating. Uh, uh, to have taken this long and it's not over yet in terms of what they should have been doing um, to resolve this. Representative Stebbins. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just want to make sure I, uh, I heard you correctly. I think what you said was the ANR water quality permit makes it so that you can no longer fluctuate the water levels. Um, and then you said something like uh, the Federal Water uh, Clean Water Act rules haven't changed. The ANR agrees with that. So, uh, first, am I getting that correct? Um, and then, second, um, so is it the regulatory, you know, the reg update process? Or I'm just curious where the difference of opinion is. So, largely, we, in the new permit, there's a small amount, like a foot, that can be modulated in the winter to try to protect against ice flows. And the proof that that's likely not going to work is that's a big part of the reason they want the money for the study because you know um, the fear is that there's not enough fluctuation there to protect from an ice jam which would take the whole dam out 
um, not the dam itself, the concrete dam would never come down, but there's a quarter mile away, there's an earthen dam, which if you build the water up too much with an ice jam, will wipe out the dike and the whole thing will go. Um, and so there's a modest amount in the wintertime, not nearly enough. It really takes two or three feet um, to, to manage for ice and, and water, spring water flows. In the summertime, it's zero. Um, in fact, we're supposed to dream up how to add water to the system when there isn't. We're supposed to keep 0, 0.0 positive and negative in that permit, um, which is not practicable, of course. So, um, so yeah, so that's that. And in terms of the federal and state, um, as I said, uh, what we proposed for a settlement agreement would meet all federal and state laws, rules, and regulations. State rules have certainly changed over the arc of time, including when I was secretary. So they have evolved um, a lot. Um, I've just heard through the history that um, people always say that, 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 that no permits can be issued because of the Clean Water Act, which is an easy thing to fall back on. That's actually not the case. And, um, and I think the fact we were able to find a way to come up with a proposed settlement that um, and our agreed met um, all state and federal rules and laws and regulations um, is testament to that. I'm not here to, I, I do wanna just add, I, I, I'm sure I sound very grapey and I don't mean to. That's really not the purpose here. The purpose is we have come to a place where we're surrendering. Um, I just wanna do it quick. I wanna get on with life, tear the bandaid off, has a dilatory effect. At this point, the decisions are made. I'm not asking you to investigate the decision um, you know, that's water over the proverbial damn pun intended, right? Um, so I only shared all that to give you a sense of how we got here. Further questions? All right. Um, well, yes, thank you for your testimony. I'm sorry we're in this place. That's what it is. I'll get you some written testimony and we'll provide you a, a, a sentence or two, potential inclusion. Yeah, that'd be great. Language would be great. We'll do that. On your request. Did you, did, I'm sorry, I was distracted. Did you say you'll give us your written testimony and some yeah. language? Both. Great. Yes, Thanks absolutely. For that. Yep. Great. Um, as soon as possible.